Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. This week, I chat with actor Michael Devine. Michael recently took on the all-too-real role in the HBO series The Undoing, where he played series regular Detective Paul O'Rourke. Michael is a real-life, recently retired detective sergeant for the NYPD. So we talk about his love of acting, his career transitions, finding authenticity in his roles, and much more. The Undoing recently concluded on HBO. If you want to go check out a wild slice of crime noir, it's a fun watch. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Michael. Les, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for making time today. I really appreciate it. Oh, I'm glad to do it. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, I, f- I feel like your uh, journey in act, your, your story is just great. Uh, you Son of a cop, grandfather's a, a police officer as well. So, of course, you grew up to major in acting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then you throw everybody the curveball by becoming an officer in New York. And then back to acting. I it can you. I'm always fascinated to hear how people get bit by the acting bug and push past that embarrassment, sheepish. Yeah, I think I really want to make a go at this kind of hump. And and I particularly, I'm sure when you've got some family pressure, can you talk a little bit about uh, what drove you to acting, and then and then what brought you back to uh, uh, being an officer? Sure, absolutely. The acting bug was. I think that was just that that came at birth. You know, I've heard the story of so many actors that said, you know, they were just, it was just where their heart took them. And they knew at a young age, and in my case, I mean, it was right from the school plays. And ever since I was, you know, in the school talent show, Dancing to Greece in uh, second grade, I think I was sort of on that path. And I followed a path that most actors would take, you know, community theater, school plays, and then I went to college for it. And I was driven and focused, and I was going to be a professional actor. And then I graduated college with a degree in acting, still on that path. And I tried it. I actually, I found my way into management also, you know, in, in theater, in, in, the, in the business. But something happened when I was 26, and I don't know where it came from. And, and uh, even though you thought maybe my family might have pushed me, it was the exact opposite. They were very supportive of my choice, you know, to follow a career in, in, in acting, And I floored them when I I said, you know, I need to do this because there was just this, I know it sounds corny, but there was a bit of a higher calling. And like you said, my grandfather was a cop. He was the detective in the NYPD and my father was a federal agent. And I guess we can try as hard as we can to uh, deny our blood chemistry sometimes. And I don't know if even my intent to go into acting was intentional to, to steer far away from the family business. I don't know if it was, I just followed my heart, Mm -hmm. but at 26, I followed my heart again. And I just felt this compulsion. And and I I guess as I was approaching 30, I wanted to try something new and I had achieved some goals that were great, but it, it seemed unfulfilling and a bit hollow. And I remember saying, okay, I'm going to try this till I'm 30. And you know, if, if, if I hate it, I can always go back. And, and that was a long time ago, Les. (laughs) <laughs> and I kept going and, uh, and I just completed 22 years. Wow. And so along the way, uh, I know you, 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 you picked up, uh, some acting gigs here and there, uh, uh, third watch and, and some little things, but what, what, how, how did it feel when your heart kind of started to steer back towards it? You know, I actually, it was probably, you know, around September 11th, the, the big one of 01, obviously, uh, I think at that point I still was fairly new. I was a rookie cop, so I couldn't get days off, but I did feel, you know, all right, I made it through this day and this period, and I realized just how fleeting life is. So I'm thinking maybe maybe this is something I need to try. Um, and then I found myself 
back into it. And there was no way I was going to leave the police department because I, I, you know, I just started and I loved it. But I thought, okay, maybe there's some marketability. There's all these cop shows. So maybe, you know, a cop with a degree in acting might, you know, in, you know, be, be something that I bring to the table. And I actually worked with a cop, David Zayas. Have you, have you ever heard of him? Yeah. He's done yeah. Really well Angel on Dexter. Yeah. yeah. No, he's, he's great. Totally. Yeah. We were cops together in, in Times Square and he had, he had done very well. And, uh, you know, he left the department, I think when he got Oz. So I knew that, you know, it, it, it is a path that could be there. So I started to, to think, well, maybe let me try them both. And I, I did. I got some some bit parts, and then little by little, I built up my resume. And then uh, then I started getting parts which weren't cops, which was you know sort of a double win. I, that was always great. And I started to kind of expand my resume, and and, and I you know I tried as much as I could to you know uh, play different roles and, and and show that I did have a, a range. And, and uh, I love the cop roles, of course. It was my bread and butter. It got me my sad card, but. You know, I am capable of uh, a lot. So, so when I started to get roles that weren't cops, it was it was even, even double. I know it was still a, a fed, but I I loved. Uh, I thought you were great on Limitless. That was a super fun show. I actually <laughs> got in a second season. Uh, Thank you. It, I mean, it, it. I can definitely understand what you. I was thinking earlier that it it had to have been nerve wracking to be an, an actor, and if you're if you're starting to think about raising a family, that's just an uncertain uh, paycheck. And uh, no matter how good you are, right. and uh, you you're not gonna, it's not ever gonna arrive on the first every month, and and so I could see yeah. you know uh, being an officer being a lot steadier job, but but carries a completely different set of stress on raising a family. Uh, I would I would imagine. Yes. Uh, yes. The the fascinating thing I I think you would bring to the table, like like you'd mentioned, of being an actor who has also been an active duty police officer. Uh, I think about how often friends of mine who are in medicine uh, watch or, or actively don't watch medical shows because they just scream at the TV. <laughs> like, you can't do that. That'll kill everybody in the room. Uh, and I would imagine growing up with, with uh, an agent and an officer you know, in the family, you, you caught some of that as a kid. But were there things when you, when you went from being an actor to being a police officer, were there things that surprised you of like, never saw that on TV? There were from time to time, and, and it was uh, there was a period where I would watch with such uh, a detailed eye that I drove myself insane. I remember even before I was on third watch, watching it and saying, "Okay, he put the wrong you know parking ticket. He put you know he put the uh, he kept the envelope and put the, his copy on the car and little things like yeah. that." And and everyone watching doesn't care, but sometimes when. I, you know, what I brought to the table, I would often think, what would the guys at work say about this? I mean, can we meet in the middle or, or if if the guys watching this at work in the lounge on their lunch break, if they're throwing things at the TV, I can't get away with this. But there are certain things, you know, I have a good friend who's a, a techno, technical advisor on, on a lot of the shows. And, and his sort of motto is, you know, we're not making a documentary. So we we do want to keep it real, but you, you do want to make it, you know, <laughs> meet in the middle where, the, where it's still interesting because it's, you know, if it's if the, the day-to-day life of a cop was shown, it would be incredibly boring. So <laughs> there's all just that sweet spot where everything meets in the middle, where it's the, a level of authenticity in both the performance and then the technical aspects. You know, I wouldn't put the, the wrong copy of the, the parking ticket on the car. Um, so I, I, and it also, I guess it goes back to being a good actor because I can sort of look at Someone playing, especially if it's a if it's a law enforcement role, I can look at it and, and I can see the inauthenticity, whether it's in uh, just the, the whether they do something with too much bravado or, um, you know, it's it's and it's tough to articulate. You can you can see that you can you can hear it because it is it's tough to articulate, but you just you know it when you see it. And I think that I can. Uh, I can. I think that's. I don't know if that's just my law enforcement background or if it's my background as a cop, but I, I can see when someone is 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 faking it. Yeah, that to me those those are the kinds of small things that maybe as an audience member I don't know what I'm picking up, but but when you come out of a movie or a show and you're like, you know what, I can't put my finger on it, but that was higher quality than the thing I watched last night. And, and I feel yeah. like it's, it's something, you know, it's those tiny things. And, uh, and I, you know, I don't always know uh, what to say it exactly was in the performance, but 
I, I like to feel like that research and that knowledge uh, seeps through. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, whatever the profession or whatever, you know, I guess in some of these, these, you know, the television shows are so specific right now. It's a medical show or a cop show or, you know, different types of shows. So, and we're always going to have that, but I guess we're trying to, uh, to appeal to the masses as well. And and you're right. They may know that something is off, but they may not be able to, to, to know what it is or articulate what it is. Now, uh, of course the show you've got going now of your, your, playing uh, detective uh, Paul Rourke, but uh, is a, a dark noir. We're definitely not going to be able to talk about the plot very much. I feel like The Undoing right. is a show that it is rewarded by uh, by the kind of return of week-to-week programming to me. Uh, I wish we had yes. actual water coolers we could get around right this second, but that would be incredibly dangerous, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, as I understand it, this was uh, this was not a not a self tape as, as so many auditions are but you you were auditioning in person and y'all shot this a little while ago but held it is that correct or shot it last year yeah it, we sh- we shot it last year it was a uh, march through like july of last year um and i think it was due to be released in may of 2020 and then of course covid hit so i they, i think the intent they, they were, they waited, they held on to it through obviously through October. And I think mainly, and this is just my guess that with everything halting production, you know, networks kind of said, Oh, we're not going to have enough uh, content. So we need to sort of, you know, s- uh, scatter our content. So we have enough to release or have something to release in the fall. And so they staggered it a bit. So that was, kind of, I think that's my guess as to why. And I think there might've been some post-production too, which, which wasn't able to be completed because of COVID. But ultimately, I, I'm actually glad that, you know, we got a few more months on it. And uh, um, I think October just seems to be the right time of year or the, the, the fall for this show. To, it seems to hit in the right time of year. I feel like it. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it doesn't feel like a very springtime show. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, but no. and, and I, I honestly, as as an avid TV watcher, I, I've been kind of waiting with apprehension for this covid wall of of like no more content but you're still stuck at home uh, i think we've right. all got our backlist of of you know what were the five shows my friends have told me to watch that i never have uh just in case yeah uh and and so i i, I love that we're still getting new to me you know even if it's you know uh was going to come out in the spring i didn't know that so uh, hit, right. it hit when it hit for me uh, can you talk a little bit about uh your character and, uh, and, and were there things about it that, that how do you differentiate your various officers? What, how do you go into this and make sure that you're not just, uh, playing cop? Right. I, I got a very, I actually read the book and to be honest, the book had a great, it's such a good book and it was translated so well by David E. Kelly onto a screenplay. So he, he gives you so much between the dialogue. So there's already so, I say he, he and, and she, the, uh, Jean uh, Corliff, the original author, um, they give you so much. So reading the book really was a nice glimpse into his psyche. And then the way that he plays off of Joe Mendoza, Detective Mendoza, who's very suave and polished and, and Edgar Ramirez himself you know, brings that in spades. He, he himself is extremely handsome and he's, and he's very polished. So I had, uh, you know, an opportunity to sort of offset that and play a bit of counterpoint and have fun with that. So I, I thought of some detectives that I work with who are just a little rough around the edges. And, uh, there was one or two in particular. And, uh, um, I, I worked with a guy named Brian Burke and he was just, he, he didn't, no, he he always mispronounced things, and he he's a little rough around the edges. He sort of lacked, you know, the skill that some detectives should have that they need to adjust between speaking to a victim, speaking to a child, and then speaking to a perpetrator. He just spoke to everyone the same, and he was a little rough around the edges. And and so I thought it, you know, not that I I think Paul O'Rourke is a good detective, but he's just and this was the way it was described to me very early on. He's good, but he's not as good as Mendoza. Hmm. So I, I kind of amped up the New York accent just a touch because that's what Brian Burke sounds like. And uh, I, I unbuttoned the top button because he would never have his, his top button unbuttoned. So those were, were little, you know, elements that, that I felt helped form the character. And it was really just, in a way, 
you know, I wasn't doing impression, but I was sort of channeling these, these, these people that I knew, these real people. And I, and I worked with them for so long. I saw the nuances. So, um, I kind of, uh, he's a bit of an amalgam of, of different people that I knew, I know, but, but hopefully at the end of the day, he, he was nonetheless authentic. I feel like the talent, uh, brought to bear on this show is, is really staggering. I, I, Lily Rave is great in everything. Of course, Donald Sutherland yes. is just legendary. Hugh Grant, Nicole Kidman, yes. uh, Kelly himself. Uh, yeah, it, it's just a great project. Did, did you know, uh, how many people were cast or what did you know going into the project uh, as to as to what it was going to be? I think I only knew at the time. I knew that it was David E. Kelly. And I think I, I definitely knew that it was HBO and it was Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant. I don't think I knew anybody else. So they were slowly getting attached around the time where I got the part. And I didn't know that Edgar had gotten the part until I um, I'd gotten the schedule after I'd already been hired. And uh, they just gave me the heads up that he was shooting a film and they were just sort of working around. Um, there, there, there were, they kind of put out most of our scenes toward the back of the shoot because they, they were waiting on Edgar. So I, um, I, I, I only knew he was attached later, but with each, with each name that got attached, I, I got more and more excited and more nervous. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I think everybody should check it out. I mean, I know everybody's stuck at home and it's, it's a, there's a great noir show over on HBO. Uh, everybody should go watch. Uh, it's a good escape, isn't it? It's, it's, I think uh, it's, a good, it's a good escape from, from reality. And we've been discussing, I've been talking all year with friends about uh, whether or not this is a year where you can stand to watch you know, dark crime documentaries or noir or horror or whether you just want uh, to rewatch the good place or Ted Lasso or something. And I, I keep <laughs> flooding between both. I, you know, I, I go on binges of, of wanting to watch the most mindlessly cheerful thing I could find on television. And then, uh, you know, two weeks of, uh, uh, I'll be gone in the dark or something. <laughs> and, uh, yes. Uh, and so, yeah, w- whenever I see anything that anybody can term noir come up, there's an immediate, like, well, you know, I'm going to have to watch at least one of those. Definitely. Thank you so much for making time to talk to me about it today. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, pleasure is mine. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Larson. TV Dudes is an independently run podcast out of Austin, Texas. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is done by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to the TV Dudes.com. I'm Randy Lander. I'm Les Weiler. And I'm Kyle Scott. Thanks for listening.